Hey, Heart listeners. I hope you're enjoying the show. We just have a quick request. We are conducting a survey to hear from you, our listeners. Just go to survey.prx.org slash heart to take the survey today. Let us know what you think. We're so excited to hear from you. That's survey.prx.org slash heart. Survey.prx.org slash heart. It means a lot to us. Happy listening. From CBC Podcasts, Mermaid Palace, and Radiotopia, welcome to the heart. I'm Caitlin Prest. And this is Dad. The series is serialized, so if you're just coming in now, go to the first episode of Dad, which is called Forgive and Forget, and start there. We ended the last episode on the train. I'm on my way home to Ottawa. I feel a lump in my throat this time. It's Easter weekend, April 2023, the Jesus holiday, the man who popularized forgiveness. The last time I came home to Ottawa, I had a little bit of a meltdown after playing a piece of audio that I made. The episode that is your version of the story, your experience. Playing it for the family made me hurt in ways I wasn't expecting. The reason for the trip is to do the follow-up interview with my dad, the one that I've been avoiding doing since 2020. Part of me wanted to come and experience the warmth and peace and love I usually feel when I'm there. But the specter of all of this, the specter of the absent of apology, clouds that. Even though I'm on my way home, I kind of wish the train was going the other way. When I arrive through the garage door, I see that the bedroom has been pre-rearranged in the exact way that I always rearrange it when I'm here. I rearrange it so that the bed frame is blocking the closet and the bed is facing the window. And then before I leave, I re-rearrange it back to the bed facing the door and the closet being accessible as it should be. The way that I rearrange it is so absurd that I know that they would not have willingly arranged the bedroom this way. I get nervous. Did I forget to re-rearrange the room last time I was here? I ask mom, did I forget? And mom says, no. Dad and I woke up this morning and pre-rearranged it for you, just the way you like it for when you arrived. I'm so moved by this act of consideration that I immediately abandon all of the wounded feelings that I have from last time and playing the episode for them and them not clocking that I was totally fucked up about it. I let the wounded feelings dissolve into the comfort. The part of me that knows that my reality is real is a little annoyed, and the part of me that prefers to deny that my reality is real takes the win. Some part of me believes that if I can do what I set out to do and actually say all the things I need to say to him without placating him, it'll be like going back in time and undoing the damage. I'll be healed forever of every single problem. Another part of me believes that He'll apologize and it'll feel like nothing. It will just be words. But I spent years trying to get him to say, torturing myself wondering what it means that he hasn't said it or he's not going to say it or he doesn't feel like saying it or he hasn't figured out how to say it. And then he'll finally say it and it won't make any difference. I'm going to have to therapize myself for the rest of my life regardless. There's a really big part of me that's afraid that once I all the way go here, there's no going back. That as long as I never try as hard as I humanly possibly can to explain to him the way that I feel about this, that I won't ever have to face the reality of a disappointing result. A disappointing result might mean that choosing to be in this relationship with the level of intimacy and closeness that I have been isn't something that I can do while still taking care of myself and respecting myself. If I never open this door, I can go on believing that if I did choose to open it, the man I want to believe he is would be standing there, like maybe he's standing there right now. I don't need to open the door. I can just leave it closed and believe that if I did open it, he would definitely be standing there. As I sit at the table 
that I always move from the living room into the bedroom. I think thoughts that I've never thought before. What if I just don't do this? Don't have the conversation and super duper don't do the story. Just because it's important and just because a lot of people go through this and just because I'm in the rare situation of having a dad who's actually willing to talk about it, what if how important that is isn't more important than my well-being, that the possible healing that it could offer other people is not more important than the healing of me? For the first time in my life, the thought enters my mind that it's not worth it. This feels like an important thought that I'm having. After thinking these thoughts, I start thinking all kinds of other thoughts I've never thought before. What would it be like if you broke a contract, quit a job, if you never made anything about trauma ever again? I start writing a list of other episodes I could make, ways that I could still somehow get the money from the contract while still not doing the episodes. And as I think these thoughts, I realize that I'm winning at therapy. An image pops into my mind of every single therapist I've ever had doing a standing ovation for the thoughts that I'm thinking. Goals are Rachel, Bev, Anna. Now I'm suddenly realizing that I haven't had that many therapists. I'm a Leo. Uh, I'm loyal. I stay long. But also in the crowd, Paula, the company therapist, our family therapist, Blake, our HR person, Georgia Wall, the ceremonialist who made a ceremony to heal my art practice, the anti-capitalist life coach, Carol, all of the potential sponsors that I called and then ghosted, the spiritual gangsters, codependents, anonymous, Johnny Nicholas is 100% doing a standing ovation. All of the friends who have watched me make a wreckage of myself, who were thrust into the wreckage of myself, who had to pick up the pieces of the wreckage of myself because of the way that I believed the work mattered more than my body because my body wasn't real to me. And probably some people in the radio industry that I wished were not doing the standing ovation were happy to see I'm going to make stuff about other things. I fall asleep to the sound of the applause, feeling very certain of my new plan. I'm not going to do this story. I'm not going to do this conversation. I'm not going to do this story. I'm not going to have the conversation. And I wake up to the smell of coffee being poured from a French press into my favorite cup with a little bit of warmed milk at the bottom. Dad wants to know what my schedule for the day is, if I have time for a bike ride, and whether we can do the follow-up interview I've been talking about since 2020 at 4 p.m. If there's one thing I've learned about healing... It's that it's a process. I don't bat an eye and I say, yes, we'll do it at 4 p.m. right after our bike ride. And the closer that we get to being back home, about to do the interview, the more anxious I become. And as I notice that I'm feeling anxious, I win at therapy again. I ask myself what I can do to take care of myself. Okay, so the new plan is I'm just going to sit down and tell Dad about the predicament I'm in. I'm just going to tell him that I have five more episodes on the contract. One of the episodes I've finished is the one that he heard. I don't feel like talking about all the stuff. It doesn't feel... I don't even want to tell him that it doesn't feel safe because I don't feel safe to say that it doesn't feel safe. I'm just going to say I don't want to talk about all the stuff. It's too painful. I don't want to make a thing about all the stuff. It's too painful. So what should I do? It's not lost on me that asking him what he thinks I should do is not necessarily winning at therapy, but it's what feels comfortable and good to me. Because even if I'm not sure if I can count on him to apologize and take responsibility, I know that I can count on him to try to help me in whatever way he can. 
I'm nervous. I was super proud of you when you went to Nicaragua. Oh, yeah. And so I'm is he. And then again, I was proud of you when you continued with in Concordia. In Communications, yeah. He's doing what I do Program. when I'm nervous. Right? I was totally proud of you for dumpster diving and finding all the free food. <laughs> He's love bombing me. Well, this is nice. Keep it coming. And then again, I was proud of you when you uh, uh, figured out a way to cut your uh, tuition in a corner. Yeah, seriously. And I'm doing what he does when he's nervous. I told her all of my revelations about... I'm being kind of spiky. Okay. Oh, Jesus. And sharp. They're not that... Okay, fine. We go upstairs to what's known as the cardinal room. In the room, the cardinal room. It's the room with a lot of things that have cardinals on them. Your office. Not my office, but... Or a temporary office. For now, you sit on the bed. Oh, by the way, these are recycled, right? I know. Okay. I don't know where's the recycling in this house. <laughs> okay, and the garage, for sure. You can't miss the big recycle bins that you just parked at the well, So you side. just go out there and... Throw the recycling no, 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 no. Even if my plan is to tell him that I don't want to talk about the stuff... There's a chance we might talk about the stuff. Okay, then. So, questions? I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Dad sits down on the day bed with a cardinal blanket and cardinal pillows. Uh, I guess I have to hold this for you. I sit on a white wooden chair facing him. And I'm fiddling. I'm trying to set up the mic stand. It's right here. Okay, Dad, uh, I want you to be uh, mentally prepared that this will take an hour. An hour, okay, fine. Okay, let's do it. Uh, okay, fine. Let's go. Is, it, is that You're okay? You're important. You can no, tell me. Right. I, you, I no, just sound like, uh, if we don't, I mean, I just feel like uh, okay, I'm going to have fine. to wait let's just go. until next time. No. I just want to get it done. Hello. Okay. Say things. Hi there. Beautiful. I love your lipstick. Thank you. You have great eyes. <laughs> They're sort of green and brown at the same time. Yeah. And um, what else? We had a wonderful bike ride. Okay. Hello. Hello. I'm going to let the interview roll relatively as is for almost 15 minutes. You can imagine yourself sitting either on the day bed facing your daughter. Hi, Kate. Or on the white chair. Facing your dad. Hi, dad. Sup? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Or you can be one of the cardinals if you want. To give you a little bit more of a picture, my dad and I have the same nose. They're big, big noses. We both have the same color of eyes. And we talk with our hands. I'm leaving the first five minutes unedited. Think about the fact that what you're hearing is exactly what happened. I guess I wanted the interview, I wanted this one to be just about, like, I guess I just, I don't really know what it should be about, and I wanted to talk to you about it. Okay. I thought I could just ask you what it should be about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'll tell you kind of what the story was supposed to be. All right, that's good. Um, that could get me going. Yeah, I guess... It's like at the beginning, what I wanted it to be. Remember, do you remember whenever I said I want, it's about power dynamics? I mm, don't remember what I said, but I was uncomfortable and I didn't like it. <laughs> you I, said, okay. you said you are a power dynamic. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that sounds perfect. Yeah. What do you mean by that, dad? I mean that uh, everything was always revolving around you through the trouble years, we were all wrapped around your finger. That's what my impression was. You know, not yours, obviously, but my impression was we were all wrapped around your little finger. Natalie and mom, especially, not so much me, perhaps, but, you know, because I was fighting it. I was fighting it. It reminded me of with my, well, my sisters, both Patty and Leanne. Uh, Patty and I had our share of altercations but leanne and i it was very similar some of us in the family believe that leanne also had bpd it's also my belief that leanne was traumatized at a young age by her dad it was before teen we weren't even a teenager or fully fledged dad and you know and then we had it started having our 
Uh, I'd like to. I, I'd like to take this opportunity. I mean, I guess it's kind of off topic, but seeing as we're here and it's intimate, to say to say, you know, that I'm sorry about in some you know in some of the cases and many of the cases the way I reacted. Sorry for uh, not being complete, not being the adult, you know, not being the adult and being so raging. I was raging, and it certainly brought out the raging in you. And, um, uh, but like we've said before, I was the adult and so I'm sorry. It was hard though. I, you have to acknowledge that it was hard for me because I came from the, you know, my family where my dad was like, you didn't, you did not disagree with that guy, you know, even though he never laid a hand on me. And, um, uh, but, um. So coming back to the my dad thing, I couldn't accept that uh, two things. My wunderkind, you know, all of a sudden hated me. And you wouldn't listen to me. Like, you wouldn't obey me. And it was more than that. You know, it was like, uh, I'm the dad. And anyway, so... There, there's, there, there's that. So, um, what was the question? I said, well, you, th- it's good that you're getting straight d- right down to it, I guess, because mm-hmm. it's just hard. I guess it's hard to try to tell the story of our relationship without talking about all that. Mm-hmm. It's like every time I sit down to try to tell all the good stuff, that's just the thing. Just like it's like the the eye of the storm or something. Um, and um, and I guess it even now, like maybe, like I appreciate your apology, but I guess it feels like you're still, like I was. I'm going through. I'm listening, p- pulling up all the recordings of all, over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's this one recording where I ask you, "What's the deal with Jesus dying?" Mm-hmm. And you say, you know, it was that you could be forgiven if you felt truly remorseful. Mm. What, maybe this is a question, what stands in the way between, like, it's like you feel bad about it, and then your mind starts to go into, well, but not so bad, and not, and there were reasons, and there were this and that and that. Like, why do you think that you're, that you're avoiding the, like, the sadness of, of true remorse, you know? Why, when you almost touch the feeling of, like, shame or, like, regret... Um, no, but you don't get it, that I am remorseful. Mm-hmm. I am remorseful. Like, okay, do you want me to cut myself? You know, like... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm remorseful. And uh, I, I... You know, uh, and... I think the reason why it feels like you're not is because when we talk about it, like there's this tiny moment of remorse, but then the and then the justification happens right after. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I and know. for me, when I receive it, it feels like what I'm receiving is mostly justification, at, with it with a little tiny moment of of a, almost a glimmer of remorse. Okay, but, and I, and I, but, I, but say- I apologize, and I'm sincere, so I shouldn't go into that the 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 the, the defense mode. I'm just trying to you know think myself, uh, uh, analyze myself, where what well, caused think- it. Yeah, you know, uh, and. No, there's no excuse, okay? So there's no excuse. It's not an excuse. It's just, yeah, it's okay. I'll stop there. Mom told me about when, um, after you listened, you know, and I went up to bed, that you had a big cry fest. And uh, I... uh, I had no idea. You know, I had no idea. And I definitely want to... (sighs) 
deal with it, I guess, you know, like take it bull by the horns, you know, and, and have it out to try to come to some kind of uh, whatever kind of resolution that can be, can, we can find. I mean, I don't want you to suffer. You know, we talked about, okay, if we need to go back to therapy, let's do it. Like, I'm totally down with that, you know, to help us. And I'm not afraid. <laughs> no, I'm not, you know, I mean, and uh, let's, uh, let's take it on, you know. So if you want to do that, let's call Radica. <laughs> call Radica. Call Dr. Phil, whatever, you know. Because thanks, Dad. Yeah, no, it's no no thanks necessary. I love you and uh and I always have and I think you do know that, but obviously there was some damage done. You know. Uh, so where do we go from here? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. That means a lot. It's okay. That's, uh, you don't have to thank me. You don't have to <laughs> thank me, honestly. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Because I think that, like, I think it's like, I'll tell you, can I tell you a little bit? Um, I think for me, obviously, um, you know, because we were besties when I was a kid, right? Like, yeah. you were my best friend. You were my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, what warped me is, like, trying to continue to hold on to that love mm -hmm. in spite of, Oh well, yeah, the our, the our, violence really. It's it, that's let's just call it that. You know, like because it's like, um, and what 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 happened in my mind um, as it was forming, I learned to put to 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 shrug it off. You know what I mean? Like I learned to say, oh, that's normal or whatever. That's normal. That's regular. Everyone's messed up. Everyone's fucked up. You know, people get angry. It's not that big of a deal, you know, like so so I could preser preserve my love for you and preserve my bond with you. What I did was I just then changed changed my standard of what's normal and what is OK, you know. And so and that's what they've they've explained to me that like the split that happens in me. Is like this flip flop between good dad and bad dad like the dad that I love and then scary dad, the good stuff makes it more difficult because if you were just a bad guy and you were a shitty dad, mm -hmm. then it would be simple, yeah, right? Yeah. It would be like shitty dad, okay, don't love him, the end. But because it's 98% best dad ever. <sighs> Thank you. Really? <laughs> nice, yeah. 98% best dad ever and then 2% scary. Yeah. Well, hopefully scary is Less scary, not scary as much. And, and it doesn't scare me as much. But, you know, there's been a couple of times in the past. Tanya, you know, like you still have that anger, you know, where you where you lose your, you lose My your, shit. you lose control. Yeah. You know, um, my, my defense mechanism at the time was to tell myself I was not afraid, you know. And then my therapist says, that's ridiculous, okay. You're, think of a 15-year-old and imagine a 15-year-old in your head, okay. Do you, do you really think you had the same amount of power? No. And do you really think you weren't scared? Really think about it, you know? And that's the thing that kind of warps your mind too, is when you're panicked, when you're scared, mm -hmm. truly afraid, like in the car. Yeah, oh God, yeah. I don't, you know, like yeah, in the car when you're really afraid. Really unforgivable, yeah. You know, when you're that's really, That's taking really advantage scared. of my power. That was really taking. Like that fear in the way that your mind learns how to manage it. Like that's the thing. And that's really, I mean, the the, the biggest thing, Dad, is that, in, in a lot of ways, there's nothing, like, you can't really ever do anything to fix that. It's me. Yeah. I have to work on fixing that because it's just in me now. But what does help is, is, is this conversation is helping because it's like, um, 
making it so that it's not a secret that I'm keeping where I'm like, let's not talk about how, how bad that really was because it's going to make dad feel bad about himself. No, it's okay. I can handle it. There's another thing that is when a man talks like that, it's scarier because you're bigger, you know, it just, and you're the dad really. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. There's that. Like that's like what your therapist was saying. Like, are you kidding? You know, you're when you're 15 versus a 35 year old or whatever the age was and, uh, yeah. and in control of everything. Like really, mm -hmm. like because if I really wanted to, uh, you know, you could you could be, kick me out and yeah, you could kick be, you yeah, out or ground you or whatever or lock you in a closet. Yeah, totally. literally. And then, then that's the thing. I guess that's what I learned is that there's a different. You know, yes, it's true. We're not talking. You're not like, and I understand that instinct to be like, well, I'm not those things, but it doesn't help to just to then use no, that. No, as no, a no. Way. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. No, yeah. no. I'm just saying that's how it can be. Like that. That is a possibility. So that adds to the scariness yeah but all this to say that does mean a lot to me hearing you say that because it's like i guess i've been you know it is real yeah thanks it dad thank you no well, i mean you know i've been thinking about it ever since you mm -hmm. know and uh so you're here now so thanks dad you're welcome uh, no i mean you don't have to thank me mm. It's a movement. We move forward. Yeah. Even coming here, I was worried because I felt the split again. Like I was like, I'm upset about these things. I want to talk about these things. It might not go well. Happen. Might not, or it might not, not go, go well. well. I'm sorry that you had that fear because I, I'm, yeah, uh, um, ashamed that you would could feel that way because I love you and I want to support you and I want you to feel that, that uh, I could take it. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. I mean, I do think it's interesting the way that once you retired, you became very, you were a very different person. Mm. I'm not surprised, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to check. I'm like, am I saying, I, do I want to say nice things just because I feel, so when people apologize to me, I get embarrassed and guilty and, and then I love bomb. But I, I guess, but no, this is true. I guess the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because you seem willing, but also because I do think that you're rare in, in this regard, sadly. You know what I mean? Like, I think that it is rare and especially for a man of your age Yep, of, the my generation. of the baby boomer generation, yeah, I don't yeah. think. But I have to say also that a, a lot of men of my generation, they try to show it in different ways. They might not be open to uh, talking yeah. about it, but try to make up for by being there for their children or whoever we're talking about or their wife or, you know, if there's real love there. Mm -hmm. And uh, making up for it, even though... Hmm. They can't. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think if there's anything more than that, I don't think we need to say more, but I think, I guess I, my only question is like, how do you feel about this being, that we're recording this right I'm now? I'm fine with it. I The thought did occur to me, okay, it's very personal. Uh, but most of my friends don't listen to podcasts. <laughs> And if they did, they're enlightened. So, you know, whatever. Whatever. I mean, like that whole thing about, oh, how, dad, how did you take it? I was kind of going, like, what do you mean? It's just life. It's just our life, you know? I, I was surprised at the question. It almost reminded me that of why making documentaries is actually really good. Because it, it with the microphones, we have a, we're here for a reason. Yeah. And we're talking about something and it's not as scary as just sitting down in a room and talking about yeah, it. Yeah, 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 I agree. Because it's for something bigger. I it's totally not... agree with that. I was just thinking that, actually. Yeah. yeah. It's not just about, yeah, 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 we're done. Let's do <laughs> Okay. No, no, we're done. I, I was just, those are the, I'm just trying to think of the last dregs. Yep. Perfect. Thanks, Dad. No, you don't need to thank me. Yet. Okay. Looking forward to it. I was <laughs> feeling bad about having, like, kind of felt, I felt like I was putting you off for, like, 
months. Well, because, you know, we were no, supposed to I do it in Toronto. I was putting it off, too. We were supposed to do it. Yeah, it's true. So yeah. we did it. Yeah, I, uh, I guess I wouldn't mind if you played some rough drafts for oh, me I as will. it's going on. Oh, I won't. I won't not. I won't because not. Because there is not no fear. Th- that's but part I, of the I, process. Basically, though, I feel like, you know, it's all truth. So, you know, I have no problem. I have no problem with truth, you know. And, uh... Again, this is how I'm invented. All right. But, um, we can, we're supposed to be at Mike's now. I know. So, um, but, uh, what was I going to talk about? Oh, God. I don't even know what to say. <clears throat> um... It's funny, I feel guilty. <sighs> That's a thought. I feel like I just got what most people never get to have. Like acknowledgement, apology, and an offer for repair. To work on repairing. That's just... That doesn't happen. That never happens. And it doesn't feel fair somehow. (sighs) The apology when he said the words, I'm sorry, that wasn't what was meaningful to me because, I don't know, I mean, he still sounded a little defensive, a, a little bit guarded. It was the second part, when he showed me that he understood, and when he said that he didn't want me to hurt, and that he wanted to deal with it and make it right. I could tell that he was saying it out of love for me, that he wanted me to be better. lucky and grateful it was so different that conversation was so different from the one we had the first time so different damn oh I feel so different about the whole thing now Now I actually want to make the show. This recording gets labeled April 15th, 2023. I go back to Toronto with a happy ending to this story on my hard drive. And I set to work weaving the tale that we are now coming to the end of. I wanted the words to mean that I was home free, that somehow the words could undo everything. And for a little while, it did. I remembered what it felt like when I was a kid. I loved my dad. No limits and no end, nothing painful to overcome. And then I was alone in Toronto, finishing 
what I started, listening to the sounds of our lives, and what I saw was a woman pleading for her dad to believe that what she lived was real. Now, as I say these words, in this moment, what I know is that I have to make a promise to myself that I'll always believe that my reality is real. And that I'll never trade that truth for love again. In the middle of June, eight days before launch day, also known as Father's Day 2023, I send everything to my dad. I'm keeping my promise. I spend a little bit of time wondering what I will do if he wants me to change things, what it will mean. Exactly the amount of time it takes to listen to all of the episodes later, he sends me this message. Just finish listening to all of them. It's fantastic. He gave two mixed notes, and then he said, I'd be happy to talk about it tomorrow if you want. I think it's a monumental work. Don't worry about how I feel because I feel really good. It's all true and touches to the core. I text him back. Five crying faces, which I use to mean happy. Thank you, Daddy. Four hearts. What a relief. Period. I feel like it's only appropriate for me to record a Father's Day message voice memo as I listen to all of the Father's Day voice memos I've ever recorded in the piece of radio that I made about us and our relationship that is going out today. It feels like such a gift that in our relationship it gets deeper and better over time, it's never stagnant, that there's always more layers to peel back. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful too that the man of integrity that I looked up to when I was a kid, when we started to fight, that came into question for me with the way that you're showing up. It shows me that you are the man that I loved when I was a kid, that you're somebody of principle and that the core and the seed of that principle is like love. <laughs> you know? And all the 
hard things that come with that. And that's very beautiful. And it's a good example to set. So thank you for that too. Love you so much. Happy Father's Day. This is the last episode of Dad, a series on the heart by me, Caitlin Prest. I'm going to share a bunch of resources after I do the credits. Please stick around if you're interested in these topics and you have your own experiences that you're struggling through. These resources will help. Thank you to the associate producer for this season, Natalie Prest. Thank you for all of the hard work that you've done. Thank you for taking care of yourself as I made this series. And thank you for going on this journey with me into podcast land. Your support over the past three years has been life-saving. Thank you to Alexandra Pinel, the researching producer on this series. Ali, you know how much your support and belief in my work has meant to me. I've told you a lot of times, and I'm telling you again. Thank you to the editorial advisors. Aliyah Pabani has been listening to Cuts of This since 2021. Thank you, Aliyah, for all of your support. Aliyah is a podcast goddess and organizer. Her most recent podcast is called We Are Not the Virus. It's about unhoused communities and housing in Toronto. It's important, and it's beautifully made. Thank you to Sarah Rose, who has also been listening to Cuts of This since 2021. Sarah. Thank you so much for all of your support and feedback and long talks on Zoom. Thank you to Jen Ng, our designer, who also let me stay in her beautiful apartment while I was working on this and trying to give Natalie space from living inside of our family trauma every single day. Thank you to Deborah Shrinde, an artist and audio maker whose beautiful ideas helped us conceive of this special family season of the heart. Thank you to Rachel Ricketts, who you heard in the last episode, giving me very, very good advice. Maria Yablonina and Harry Nazen. All three of these people have been integral. Thank you to Damon Fairless and Roshni Nair from CBC. Yuri Lasordo and Audrey Martovich from Radiotopia. And thank you to JCJ, Jennifer Custer DeRoche, our editor. Couldn't have done it without you. She's actually doing a special Mermaid Palace slash The Heart tattoo promotion in the coming month. Do you want a tattoo of The Heart's Heart, The Mermaid Wave? The word no, done by an incredibly talented artist who needs to pay New York rent and is trying to make it in this world doing her art instead of making very high-end lattes for people who can pay $7 for a coffee? Go to JCJ Tattoos on Insta. Thank you to all of the people who I forgot to thank. You are actually not forgotten, I promise. I will remember and be mad at myself at some point in the near future for forgetting. Know that if you helped in any way at any point, your name is in my heart, and I actually do think of you and cherish your support often. Big thanks to Greg Prest, the man who not only apologized, not only followed up with the transformative justice person whose contact info I forwarded to the family, not only did he take care of me relentlessly and believe in me relentlessly from the moment I was born until this moment today, not only did he drop off a bike at my apartment when I was too emotional about making the series to even come to the door and say hello, this is a man who gave me Not only his consent, but his support to make everything that you just heard. Nancy Prest is somebody that everyone wanted to hear from a little bit more. It's a little bit hard to get a word in edgewise with Natalie, Caitlin, and Greg around. My mom is an endlessly kind, loving, beautiful, brilliant woman who also gave me the green light to create a portrayal of her that didn't show the fullness of all that she is to me. Just know that she's an endlessly kind, loving, and brilliant woman. Thank you, Mom. 
If the way this story ended doesn't reflect your experience, if you're somebody who had to make the difficult choice of cutting off your relationship with your parents and you're desperate to hear that story, please read the book, What My Bones Know. You can also get it on audiobook, and it was written and recorded by one of my favorite radio makers, Stephanie Fu. It listens like a podcast that you never want to end, I swear. Stephanie Fu, as a human being, and her beautifully written book have been a big inspiration to me in my journey to heal my trauma. The book is about complex PTSD, healing from abuse, intergenerational trauma within first-generation immigrant families, and the journey of moving on. The journey of deciding to let go. The journey of finding a new family. Sometimes cutting the cord and moving on isn't what you need, but the acknowledgement and the repair you need isn't happening either. Maybe you're in the process of accepting that it'll never happen. The process of accepting the relationship that's possible with your parents, who they are and what their capacity is, can be heartbreaking. So my heart is going out to all of you who are in that place. Figuring out how to truly accept people who are different from you without self-abandoning is a possible portal to beautiful and rich relationships. And if you've never even thought of this before, but you're now starting to think about it, here is some advice from people I know who are in that place. Figure out what you need to take care of yourself inside of those relationships. Accept what they do have to give in the way that they know how to give it. Let it be enough. And then figure out what's missing and find it in other places in your life. Figure out what kind of love and support you need to feel grounded and good in this world. Even if it all doesn't come from the first people in the world that we loved, we can find all of the love and support that we dream of having, that we deserve to have, even if it mostly comes from ourselves. I'm learning that. Uh, recovering codependent, I'm learning how to make it come for myself and not roll my eyes when I hear the word self-care. Okay, it is really important. I'm, it's a whole new world. Come up with self-care plans for yourself whenever you go to hang out with your parents that make you feel like your reality is not real. Always make plans to hang out with a friend who really, really sees you right after you hang out with your parent that doesn't really see you. Sending so much love and support to all of you who are moving through this stuff. Sending so much love and support to parents who are starting a process of acknowledging and repairing ways that you passed your own trauma onto your kids. It's hard work and it's so worth it. Taking responsibility for how we hurt each other is how a more caring world starts. Resources for anyone who's interested in learning about accountability and how to repair harm. Mia Mingus speaks and writes about this a lot. Her article, The Four Parts of Accountability, is something that you can look up on the internet. Number one, naming and showing that you understand what you did. Number two, apologizing without an explanation. It has to just be an apology. Number three, repair the damage. And number four, the most important and the hardest step, change your behavior. Trying to initiate a conversation with a parent who has been abusive without any professional support or even with professional support is something that is extremely emotionally treacherous and could even be dangerous for the person who has been abused. Please always put yourself first. The most important thing is for you to think about what you need to feel emotionally safe and to figure out how to center your emotional safety always. Okay, guys, this is the end, the end, the end of the very, very long credits. This is the last piece of work until the next thing I make, which might take a while, as you might be starting to notice. If you're craving more or want to know what's coming up, follow me on Instagram at Caitlin Prest. I'm now kind of scheming and dreaming about what I want to do next, what I want to do in 2024. What my heart is really yearning to do is to get back into doing installation and performance stuff. 
experiences that simultaneously help people get into their bodies while also helping people connect with other people and also bringing them into an alternate universe where magic is real. I like creating sound walks that go inside of intimate places. So if you run an art gallery, a theater, or a festival, uh, and you want artists to create immersive audio experiences that are intimate and embodied and magic, hit me up, please. This is my dream. If you're a fan and you have the habit of financing films, or if you're a producer and you know how to finance films and you want to be a part of my very first feature, write to me at caitlin at mermaidpalace.org. And in addition to all of that, I'm just going to be chilling the fuck out, guys. I am going to be chilling the fuck out for the next little bit. I'm going to be eating oysters. I'm going to be wearing eccentric clothing. I'm going to be cooking elaborate meals. I'm going to be turning the messy drawers of my apartment into tiny art installations. I'm going to be building shelves. I'm going to be nurturing all of my plants because I've done so much healing that I am keeping hella plants alive. All of that, plus being bewildered by the endless beauty of this chaotic world. So much love. So much love. So much love but without self-abandonment, okay? This season of The Heart is in partnership with CBC Podcasts. The Heart is a proud member of Radiotopia. So you meet a woman online. I love her. I just love her. But it turns out, thousands of other people are in love with her too. Janessa Brazil. Janessa Brazil. Janessa Brazil. One woman's image is being used by criminals to target innocent people looking for love online. You win their hearts, you win their wallets. Love, Janessa. My wild quest to find her. The human face of a digital con. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Radio Tokyo.